In the heart of the Cracks domain, amidst the labyrinthine streets of the bazaar, there was an inconspicuous place known as Sparkling Scales. With no flashy signs or colorful drinks, the rustic warehouse attracted merchants looking for a refuge from the tumultuous transactions and incessant intrigue. The atmosphere was always shrouded in a perpetual haze of pungent smoke, a sign that discussions were heated and business was secretive. Zorax, a veteran of the trade routes and a regular there, leaned against the chipped counter, holding a mug of thick, oily ale. His jaw clicked rhythmically, an expression of his anxiety. He knew the story he was about to tell would hold everyone's attention, so he decided to begin. I swear by the mother of all, he hissed, his voice cutting through the buzz of the warehouse. The human was the size of a maggot, but... Zorax paused, enjoying the anticipation in his listener's eyes. But he had a ferocity and intelligence I've never seen before. The traders approached, forming a circle around Zorax. He went on to describe his surprising encounter with a small but incredibly cunning human. The human had been attacked by much larger opponents, creatures Zorax would normally have considered invincible. But the human did not back down. Using only writing implements, a pen, a pencil, and a paper clip, he defended himself impressively. The pen became a deadly weapon in his hands. Zorax gestured dramatically. It pierced the thick skin of one of the attackers with surgical precision. The pen he used to disarm another, jamming it into the creature's knuckles, immobilizing it. And the paper clip. He transformed into a makeshift harpoon, tangling it in the membrane of another opponent's wing, causing it to collapse. The eyes of those present were fixed on Zorax, absorbing every detail of the tale. The warehouse, usually buzzing with side conversations, was completely silent except for Zorax's voice. He ended his tale with a subtle bow, acknowledging the cunning and cruelty of the human. As soon as Zorax finished, the reactions were mixed. Rock, a giant glowbar known for his disbelief in the abilities of humans, let out a mocking laugh. Writing utensils? Fairy tales to scare children? He snorted in disbelief. On the other hand, Fillion, a slim, sharp-witted merchant, passionately defended human ingenuity. You underestimate humans, he panted, his voice thin but determined. I've seen a human subdue an entire band of invaders with nothing but a roll of duct tape. They see possibilities where we see limits. The heated discussion continued, some merchants laughing at the idea, others seriously considering Zorax and Fillion's words. The stories shared there in the shimmering scales were a testament to the complexity and adaptability of humans. Gradually, the atmosphere in the warehouse was filled with an uneasy respect and growing curiosity. The chatter died down and the merchants scattered to their tables, each lost in thought over the stories they had heard. The atmosphere in the warehouse had changed. There was a new perception now, a mixture of respect and caution toward the humans. Zorax watched the change with a satisfied smile, aware that he had planted a seed of admiration and awe in the hearts of his colleagues. The atmosphere in the shimmering scales remained tense after Zorax's story. The shopkeepers, still digesting the tale, looked at each other with curiosity and a touch of disbelief. Gradually, the haze of pungent smoke seemed to thicken, reflecting the weight of stories yet to be told. Fillion, a slender merchant with a sharp mind, spoke. His voice was thin but clear, and he cut through the silence with determination. I, too, have a story of human ingenuity, he began his eyes shining with a mixture of respect and wonder. It was a group of invaders, brutes who feared nothing. But this human, he subdued them with nothing more than a roll of duct tape. The others frowned, some showing skepticism, but Fillion continued. He used the tape to attach weapons, to immobilize the invaders, and even to create improvised traps. With each move, he displayed an almost preternatural ability to transform a mundane object into a survival tool. As Fillion detailed each step of the human's ingenious defense, the trader's attention deepened. His descriptions were vivid, almost obvious. Duct tape, something so simple and mundane, had become a weapon in the hands of the human, and it made the audience rethink their own notions of usefulness and creativity. When Fillion finished, an imposing Thorian with skin the color of granite stood up. His voice was deep and resonant, and he seemed to carry the weight of his race's many stories. I knew a human who was captured and placed in a seemingly inescapable cell, he began, 
his eyes fixed on a distant point as if reliving the memory. But this human, he took the cell apart piece by piece, using nothing but what he found around him. He turned a spoon into a makeshift key, a piece of metal into a blade. The merchants were stunned. The ability to transform ordinary objects into deadly weapons was not only a demonstration of ingenuity, but also of fierce tenacity. The Thorian continued, his voice carrying a gravity that echoed through the warehouse. Each dismantled piece became part of a larger plan. In the end, he not only escaped, but disarmed his captors, leaving a clear message of human adaptability and cunning. The stories continued, each contributing to an atmosphere charged with respect and fear for humans. The traitors, once skeptical, were now forced to acknowledge human ingenuity. Even Rock, the giant Globar who had scoffed at Zorax's first story, began to reconsider his position. His eyes shone with new insight as he pondered the stories he had heard. Perhaps, perhaps there is more to humans than meets the eye, he muttered, more to himself than to the others. The admission, subtle as it was, was a testament to the effect the stories had had. Then suddenly, the warehouse door creaked open, and a human entered. Conversation immediately ceased, and all eyes turned to the figure that crossed the threshold. He was of medium height and dressed simply, but his presence commanded the attention of the room. The silence that followed was almost evident, charged with a new tension and curiosity. The human, apparently unaware of the sudden change in atmosphere, walked over to the counter and ordered a local drink. While he waited, the shopkeepers exchanged meaningful glances, each wondering what the human's presence meant. The warehouse, shrouded in a haze of smoke and anticipation, had become a stage for the next phase of this unfolding story. The shopkeepers continued to watch with curiosity and caution. The story of Zorax was still fresh in their minds, and to see an actual human standing before them evoked mixed emotions. But John's calm, carefree demeanor began to ease the tension. There were no sudden movements, no challenging words. He was just there, sipping his drink. As the minutes passed, the initial attention gave way to muttered conversation. The shopkeepers, still keeping an eye on John, resumed their activities. Curiosity remained, however. Some moved closer to discreetly observe the human, while others only cast occasional glances. John, for his part, continued to rummage through his toolbox. He took out small objects, examined them, adjusted them here and there, and then put them back. Every move was precise and meticulous, demonstrating deep skill and knowledge. Gradually, some of the braver merchants began to approach, at first just to look at the toolbox, but then to exchange a few words. John answered each in a friendly manner, always with a reassuring smile. He told stories of his travels, asked about other people's businesses, and occasionally offered to help with minor repairs to tools and equipment the tradesmen brought with them. Soon, John became a regular presence at the shimmering scales. More and more, the merchants felt comfortable with him and even sought his company. His skill with tools and his willingness to help created a network of goodwill and mutual respect. Zorax's tale of human ingenuity now had a familiar face that everyone could recognize. Among the regulars of the shimmering scales was a young crack named Crix. He was known for his insatiable curiosity and his natural aptitude for mechanics. From the moment John entered the warehouse, Crix couldn't take his eyes off him. He watched every move, every tool adjustment with growing fascination. The way John transformed ordinary objects into something useful struck a deep chord with Crix. Still hesitant, Crix slowly began to approach John. At first he watched from a safe distance, but soon he found excuses to stop by the desk where John worked. Finally one day he plucked up the courage and approached asking a shy question about one of the tools John was using. John, always friendly, replied with a smile and began to explain in detail how the object worked. From that moment on, Crix became John's shadow, following him wherever he could, absorbing every bit of knowledge John shared. Crix's fascination grew daily, and he knew there was much to learn from the human who had earned the respect of everyone in the shimmering scales with his quiet presence and surprising abilities. Crix, a young Crax known for his insatiable curiosity, couldn't take his eyes off John from the moment the human entered the shimmering scales. John's ability to transform ordinary objects into useful tools fascinated Crix. He watched John's every move, from the way he held the tools to the precise adjustments he made. Crix's interest grew daily, 
and he knew there was much to learn from this ingenious man. Determined to find out more, Crix began to watch John closely, spending more time in the shimmering scales and studying the human's every action. He positioned himself strategically so that he could observe John without seeming intrusive. The way John worked was mesmerizing, every move efficient, every tool an extension of his skill. Crix began to see things from a new perspective, realizing the potential hidden in ordinary objects. Under the guidance of the wise Thorian, one of the domain's respected elders, Crix decided to approach John. Thorian, with his vast experience and wisdom, encouraged Crix to learn from John, believing that human ingenuity could benefit the cracks in unexpected ways. With Thorian's blessing, Crix finally found the courage to speak to John. Hello, John, Crix began shyly, approaching the table where John was working. Can I watch you work? John looked up from his task and smiled warmly. Of course, Crix. Always good to have company. Grab a chair. With this simple interaction, an unlikely friendship began to blossom. John was patient and kind, explaining each tool and technique in detail. He demonstrated how to turn a piece of metal into an improvised key, how to use a simple piece of wire to create an electrical circuit, and how to adapt tools for unexpected functions. Cricks absorbed each lesson with enthusiasm, fascinated by John's creativity and adaptability. As time passed, the partnership between Cricks and John grew stronger. In addition to learning new skills, Crix began to see the world in a different way. He began to apply John's teachings to his own creations, developing new tools and solutions to problems that had previously seemed unsolvable. His natural ability with mechanics, combined with the ingenuity he learned from John, made him a promising inventor among the cracks. One evening, after a long day's work on the shimmering scales, Crix and John sat together sharing a local drink. The conversation flowed naturally, moving from stories of their respective travels to deeper discussions of the potential of their combined abilities. John, Crick said, his eyes shining with enthusiasm. Do you think we can use what we've learned to make a difference in the cracks domain? Perhaps we can find ways to improve our lives here. John nodded thoughtfully. I believe so, Cricks. Ingenuity and adaptability are our greatest strengths. If we can apply those skills strategically, we can make a real difference. The conversation continued full of ideas and plans. They discussed ways to use their skills to destabilize the rigid systems of the Dominion without resorting to direct violence. Crix and John knew that their actions would have to be intelligent and precise, making the most of the limited resources they had. With every idea they shared, Crix's determination grew, and he knew that together they could truly make a significant impact on the Crax domain. The atmosphere around them seemed to vibrate with a new energy. Crix and John were ready to carry out their plans, confident that their combined abilities could bring about the change they so desired. As Crix and John's friendship deepened, they spent more time together, not only working on their inventions, but also discussing the future of the Crax domain. The Shimmering Scales warehouse had become a strategic meeting place where they could both think freely without arousing suspicion. Crix became increasingly convinced that something had to be done to change the oppressive situation in the domain. John, with his experience and ingenuity, shared this vision and brought a unique perspective that could be crucial to the transformation. While adjusting a cutting tool one evening, Crix broke the silence with a decisive statement. John, I think we need to do more than just watch and learn. We need to act. John nodded, knowing exactly what Crix felt. I agree, but we have to be smart. We can't meet the Dominion head on. We have to find their weaknesses and exploit those loopholes. In the days that followed, Crix and John dedicated themselves to studying the rigid systems of the Crax domain. They analyzed the security patterns, the transportation routes, the communication systems, even the surveillance points. Every detail was meticulously noted and discussed. They realized that despite its impenetrable appearance, the domain had several weak points, mainly due to its reliance on rigid and inflexible structures. Now look here, John said, pointing to a holographic map of the domain. If we could cause a disruption in the main communications network, we could create enough confusion to destabilize the order. Crix, with his sharp mind for mechanical detail, suggested a series of small sabotages. What if we start by sabotaging small but essential components, nothing that would attract much attention, but enough to create a series of failures that would add up? They spent nights drawing up detailed plans, each drawing on their unique skills. John, with his human creativity, proposed ingenious methods of infiltration and sabotage, 
while Crix, with his intimate knowledge of Crack's technologies, refined these plans to ensure maximum effectiveness. Avoiding direct confrontation was essential. Instead, they would focus on creating chaos from within, becoming ghosts in the domain's systems. When they were ready, they began to execute their plans. The first phase involved small disruptions, an irrigation system that mysteriously failed, security doors that locked and unlocked themselves, and communication signals that sent static instead of commands. Each action was carefully planned to look like a simple technical malfunction, but the frequency and precision of these failures began to raise suspicions. Crix and John worked tirelessly, moving from point to point, always one step ahead of the authorities. They used their skills to create small, discrete sabotage devices that could be easily hidden and activated from a distance. Each new problem created added to the disorder, forcing the domain to expend resources and attention on constant repairs. The first signs of unrest began to appear. Domain workers, frustrated by the constant failures, began to question the competence of their leaders. The small acts of sabotage had a domino effect, and the domain's sense of absolute control began to crumble. The authorities were stunned, unaware that they were facing a carefully orchestrated internal attack. One evening, Crix and John found themselves in the shimmering scales, discreetly observing the reaction of the domain authorities. The satisfaction was evident. Look around you, Crix said with a gleam of determination in his eyes. We are making progress. The structure is beginning to give way. John smiled, his eyes fixed on the screen of a portable device that showed a series of failures in the domain's critical systems. This is only the beginning. If we keep this up, we can make a real difference. Crix nodded. Yes, but we must be careful. Each step must be calculated to maintain the element of surprise. While they planned their next moves, the shimmering scales remained a safe haven. The seeds of rebellion had been planted, and the first signs of unrest and disorder were evidence of the initial success of their efforts. The battle was just beginning, but Crix and John knew they were well on their way to challenging and eventually transforming the Rift Dominion. Sitting at a table in the corner of the shimmering scales, Crix and John realized that their little sabotages were beginning to have an effect. But they knew that something more was needed to unite the inhabitants of the Crack's domain behind a common vision. They needed a manifesto, a document that would articulate their ideas for a new order and inspire and guide others to join the cause. We need something that everyone can understand and relate to, Crix said, his mind going a thousand miles an hour. Something that not only explains the reason for our actions, but also shows them that a better future is possible. John nodded in agreement. Yes, a manifesto that describes our vision of a fairer, more adaptable dominion where everyone can thrive. We must write something powerful and inspiring. For several nights, Crix and John worked tirelessly on the manifesto. They met in the warehouse where they could discuss and debate their ideas without interruption. The document began to take shape, each section carefully crafted to address the domain's problems and offer practical and inspiring solutions. They emphasized the importance of ingenuity, adaptability, and cooperation, values they both believed were fundamental to creating a new order. We need to show how the rigidity of the current regime is stifling our potential, John said as he typed on the terminal and how a more flexible and cooperative system can benefit everyone. Crix added, We need to include concrete examples of how small actions can lead to big changes, so people can see that even the smallest efforts can contribute to our larger goal. With the manifesto finally complete, they set out to distribute it through clandestine channels. They used a network of trusted contacts to distribute the document in digital and printed form, reaching as many cracks as possible. The manifesto was transmitted discreetly, passed from hand to hand, terminal to terminal, always avoiding detection by the domain authorities. The effect was immediate. The manifesto began to circulate, sparking fervent discussions and debates among the inhabitants of the Cracks domain. In markets, workplaces, and even homes, people began talking about the ideas contained in the document. The vision of a fairer, more adaptable domain resonated deeply with many who were tired of the oppression and rigidity of the current regime. Have you read the manifesto? One shopkeeper asked another, his eyes shining with hope. They talk about a new order where we all have a voice. Discussions intensified and the idea of change began to gain momentum. 
The words of Crix and John planted seeds of hope in the hearts of the Rifts, who began to see the possibility of a different future. Small groups formed to discuss the ideas in the manifesto and plan how they could contribute to the cause. At a secret meeting held in an abandoned warehouse near the scintillating scales, a group of supporters gathered to discuss next steps. Crix and John were present, watching with satisfaction as the participants fervently debated strategies for amplifying the manifesto's message. We need to reach more people, said a young Crax woman enthusiastically. We can use the markets and meeting places to distribute more copies. Another supporter, an experienced technician, suggested, what if we could hack the domain's communication systems? We could broadcast the message on a massive scale. Crix and John listened intently, encouraged by the passion and creativity of their allies. The seeds of rebellion were growing, and the collective strength of those who believed in the new order was becoming a real movement. We're on the right track, Crick said, exchanging a confident glance with John. Let us continue to inspire and guide, and together we can transform the Cracks domain. The meeting continued, full of ideas and plans. Each person present was committed to doing their part to bring about change, motivated by the manifesto Crix and John had created. Revolution was no longer just a possibility, but a reality in the making, and they were ready to advance their vision of a more just and adaptable dominion. Crix and John's manifesto had planted the seeds of revolution throughout the Crax domain. On every street corner, in every market and workshop, small groups of Crax, inspired by the vision of a new order, began to organize. The words of the manifesto resonated deeply, sparking a series of small rebellions. These groups acted independently, each finding their own way to challenge the status quo and promote change. In one of the industrial districts, a group of workers decided to sabotage the production lines. Using techniques they learned from the manifesto, they were able to disrupt the operations of several factories without being detected. In another corner of the domain, a team of technicians hacked into the communication systems and sent messages of hope and encouragement to the ranks, urging them to unite for the cause. Each rebellion, however small, contributed to the growing instability within the domain. A group of peasants banded together to secretly redistribute food supplies, diverting cargo destined for the elite, and delivering it to the neediest communities. In the markets, merchants began using their networks to spread the manifesto and organize silent protests, refusing to pay the high taxes demanded by the regime. The ingenuity and adaptability of the cracks began to shine through. Inspired by John's teachings, they found creative and effective ways to undermine the authority of the Dominion. One rebellion used simple gardening tools to disable surveillance drones, while another used a combination of common building materials to construct barricades that slowed down security forces. The actions of these groups were coordinated in a decentralized manner, but each contributed to the same goal, destabilizing the regime and creating space for a new order. Small acts of rebellion began to add up, creating a domino effect that spread chaos throughout the Dominion. The authorities were overwhelmed, unable to deal with the many fronts on which the rebellions were taking place. As the pressure mounted, the Dominion authorities struggled to contain the rising tide of discontent. Security forces were constantly mobilized, but the dispersed and creative nature of the rebellions made it difficult to suppress the movements. Each act of repression only seemed to strengthen the resolve of the rebels, who quickly adapted to the new circumstances. In the shimmering scales, Crix and John watched the developments with satisfaction. They could see the results of their efforts in the secret messages and reports coming in from all parts of the Dominion. The vision of a new order was gaining momentum, and people were beginning to believe that change was possible. We are making a difference, Crix said, his eyes shining with determination. People are beginning to realize the power they have. John smiled in agreement. Yes, but we still have much work to do. We must continue to support these rebellions and make sure our movement doesn't lose focus. Together they began to plan the next steps, discussing new strategies to strengthen the resistance and expand the movement's reach. They knew that the struggle was far from over, but they also knew that they had taken the first crucial step. The Crick's domain was changing, and the tide of discontent they had unleashed was proof that the revolution was underway. With each new idea, Crix and John prepared to continue the fight, determined to make their vision of a fairer, more adaptable domain a reality. 
The small rebellions were just the beginning, and they were ready to face the challenges ahead, confident that they were on the right path to achieving the change they so desired. As the small rebellions intensified, tensions within the Crax domain reached a critical point. Rumors of uprisings spread quickly, and the domain's leaders, alarmed by the growing disorder, decided to act with an iron fist. The authorities began taking drastic measures to deal with dissent. Security patrols were increased, new checkpoints sprang up on every corner, and strict curfews were imposed. The Dominion's response was swift and brutal. Armed troops swept through entire neighborhoods, conducting searches and arresting suspected conspirators. Any sign of rebellion was crushed with overwhelming force in an attempt to quell the movement before it could gain momentum. But the harsher the repression, the more the fishers grew angry and determined. Operating in the shadows, Crix and John continued to orchestrate actions that further destabilized the regime. They understood that the resistance had to be flexible and unpredictable in order to survive the repression. Using technology and human knowledge, they created new resistance strategies. John adapted communications technologies to create a secure, decentralized information network that allowed the rebels to coordinate undetected. Crix used his mechanical skills to develop sabotage devices that could be easily hidden and triggered remotely. Together, they carried out coordinated attacks that hit key points in the domain's infrastructure, causing confusion and disorder. One such action was to sabotage the power plants that supplied the domain's wealthiest districts. During the night, teams of rebels following Crix and John's plans infiltrated the facilities and planted explosives in strategic locations. At dawn, the explosions plunged half the city into darkness, and the domain's response was chaotic. Another strategy involved the use of improvised drones to deliver messages and supplies to rebels in remote areas. These drones, designed by John from discarded machine parts, were almost undetectable and could fly long distances, ensuring that the resistance remained well supplied and informed. Despite the repression, the rebels' resolve only grew stronger. Every act of violence on the part of the authorities served to fuel the movement, transforming the anger and desperation of the cracks into an unrelenting force of resistance. The prisons were overcrowded, and reports of abuse only increased the solidarity of the dissidents. The domain's rulers began to realize that the situation was becoming untenable. The rebellions were not only continuing, but intensifying, challenging the regime's ability to maintain order. Infrastructure was crumbling, and the morale of the security forces was at an all-time low, worn down by the constant battle against an enemy that seemed to be everywhere and nowhere at the same time. On a quiet night in the shimmering scales, Crix and John met to assess the situation. Reports from their networks indicated that the Dominion was nearing the breaking point. Whispers of revolt echoed in every corner, and the populace, once subjugated by fear, was beginning to believe in the possibility of change. We're close to something big, Crix, John said, his eyes reflecting a mixture of weariness and determination. The people are beginning to rise. We can feel it, Crix nodded, feeling the weight of the moment. Yes, we are close to a crucial turning point. We must keep pushing, keep showing that a new future is possible. They knew the road ahead would be arduous, but they also knew they were closer than ever to their goal. With renewed determination, Crix and John continued to plan their next actions. Ready to take the fight to the end and transform the Crax domain into a place of freedom and justice for all. Crix and John sat in a secure room, their faces illuminated by the cold light of a holographic map that covered the table before them. They knew the opportunity for a decisive strike was at hand. The infrastructure of the Crax domain had been weakened by small rebellions and sabotage, and the morale of the troops was low. It was time for a coordinated attack that could shatter the regime's structure and pave the way for the new order they so desperately wanted. We need to hit critical points simultaneously, John said, his eyes fixed on the map. If we can take out the main command, communication, and supply centers, the regime will have no way to respond. Crix agreed, tracing attack routes with his finger on the holographic map. We're going to need all the rebel groups. Everyone needs to know exactly what to do and when to do it. Synchronization will be key. Over the next few days, Crix and John worked tirelessly to plan the operation. They used their secure communications networks to coordinate with rebel leaders throughout the Dominion. Coded messages were sent, and secret meetings were held to ensure everyone was prepared. The plan called for a series of synchronized attacks on three main fronts. 
the Dominion's command centers, communication stations, and supply depots. Each rebel group had a specific mission and a strict timetable to follow. Crix and John knew that any delay or communication failure could jeopardize the entire operation. On the night set for action, there was an evident tension in the air. The rebels were in position, ready to move. Crix and John coordinated everything from a makeshift base, monitoring every move through their communication devices. It's time, John said, his tone calm and firm. Let's give the signal. Crix pressed a button on his device, sending the signal to all the rebel groups. From that moment on, every second counted. The events that followed were swift and devastating. In a coordinated coup, the rebels attacked command centers, disabling security systems and incapacitating Dominion leaders. Communication stations were seized, and resistance broadcasts were sent throughout the Dominion, spreading the message of freedom and urging everyone to join the cause. In the supply depots, controlled explosions destroyed the regime's vital supplies, causing chaos and panic among the troops. Without efficient communications and supplies, the domain authorities were paralyzed, unable to coordinate an effective response. The synchronized attacks worked perfectly, each rebel group carrying out its tasks with precision and determination. The effect was immediate and overwhelming. The Dominion's infrastructure began to crumble, and the Central Authority lost control of the outlying regions. The fissures, inspired by the boldness and success of the operation, began to rise en masse, demanding change and freedom. With the collapse of the old regime, hope for a new order spread like wildfire through the rifts. Throughout the Dominion, people began to organize, forming local councils and discussing the future. The message of Crick's and John's manifesto of a more just and adaptable Dominion echoed around every corner. Crix and John, now considered leaders of the revolution, gathered at the shimmering scales, the place where it all began. They reflected on the impact of their struggle, aware that they had accomplished something monumental, but also aware that the work was far from over. We succeeded in bringing down the old regime, Crix said, looking at John. But now we must build something new in its place. John nodded, sharing his friend's sentiment. Yes, and it will be a different challenge. But just as important, we have to make sure that the principles we fought for are the foundation of the new order. As the two friends discussed the next steps, the shimmering scales vibrated with the energy of a new era. The tipping point had been reached, and Crix and John were ready to lead the final phase of their mission to transform the Crack's domain into a place of freedom, justice, and hope. With the collapse of the old regime, a new hope was born in the Crack's domain, Crix and John, now recognized as leaders of the revolution, dedicated themselves to laying the groundwork for a new order. They gathered at the Shimmering Scales, the meeting place that had been the center of so many conspiracies, to discuss the next steps. There, in the haze of pungent smoke, they began to outline a future based on the principles of ingenuity and adaptability they had learned together. We need to make sure everyone has a voice, John said as Crix jotted down his ideas. The new order must be flexible enough to adapt to change but strong enough to protect the freedom we have won. Crix agreed, adding, and we need to focus on education and innovation, teaching future generations the value of ingenuity and cooperation. In the months that followed, Crix and John worked tirelessly with other rebel leaders to establish new policies and structures for the domain. They set up community councils where any crack could voice their ideas and concerns. Decision-making became collective, based on consensus and cooperation breaking with the authoritarian rigidity of the past. Crix used his mechanical skills to help develop new technologies that made daily life easier for the cracks. He led infrastructure projects that were sustainable and adaptable, allowing communities to shape themselves according to their specific needs. John, for his part, focused on building robust, decentralized communication systems to ensure that information flowed freely and that all voices were heard. One of the biggest challenges they faced was rebuilding the education system. They implemented programs that fostered creativity and problem solving, teaching young cracks to see opportunity in every obstacle. Schools were equipped with innovation labs where students could experiment and develop new ideas. In addition, Crix and John promoted knowledge fairs and invention festivals where cracks of all ages could share their creations and learn from each other. These initiatives not only strengthened the community, but also cultivated a spirit of unity and progress. As the new domain took shape, 
Cricks and John Story became a symbol of resistance and change. They were often invited to speak at events and ceremonies, sharing their experiences and inspiring future generations. Their names became synonymous with ingenuity and adaptability, and many young crackers aspired to follow in their footsteps. The Cracks domain entered a new era of prosperity and innovation. The economy flourished with new inventions and technologies, and society became more just and inclusive. The oppression and rigidity of the old regime were now a distant memory, replaced by a vibrant spirit of cooperation and creativity. One sunny afternoon, Cricks and John found themselves on a hilltop with a panoramic view of the domain. They watched the communities below go about their daily business and felt a deep sense of accomplishment. We did it, Crick said with a satisfied smile. We've created something very special here. John nodded, his eyes fixed on the horizon. Yes, and this is just the beginning. There's so much more we can do, so many new possibilities to explore. They sat in silence for a moment, taking in the beauty of what they had helped to build. The future was full of challenges, but it was also full of opportunity, and together they were ready to face whatever came their way. We're ready, John finally said. Let's keep working, keep inspiring, and make sure our legacy endures. Crick smiled, feeling the same determination. Yes, we will. The future awaits us.